Hey guys, I hope you're doing well. I hope your semester is, you know, going great. You know, we're ending the year of the semester. And before I start, if you hear any, you know, construction noise, there's construction happening around my house. So I apologize for any convenience that causes. But, you know, anyways, I had to say that before I start. I'm very, very excited to be presenting today. Um, super. There's two reasons for that, actually. The first one being is I'm super glad that we got to choose our own topics because I could basically present and talk about something for like 20 minutes about a scientific topic that I find interesting and enjoy, truly. So creating this um, presentation and doing this presentation is super, super enjoyable for me. So hopefully listening to me is enjoyable for you. The second thing is, you know, my goal here as a presenter and not even a presenter, as a teacher, because my goal here is to teach, is I want to make a very, 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 very broad topic into something very understandable to where, you know, you as scientists could understand it easily. And if, you know, Dr. Bobby comes up and asks you, what was Michael presenting about? You guys could get three or four statements, like brief statements saying how I, like what my, what my presentation was about. Another thing is that, you know, in order for me to do my job well, you know, and, you know, I want the fact of the matter is, is that I want scientists and, you know, people that aren't even in science, that are not even biology majors, to be able to understand this topic. And if I do that, then I think I did a pretty well job at teaching you guys about this topic. So without further ado, my topic today that I will be talking about for about 20 or so minutes. It's the effect of invasive species on the environment. I'm sure you guys are familiar with invasive species. I'm sure you guys somewhat, you know, maybe some of you guys may have a understanding of how they can affect the environment. But, you know, it's a very, very interesting topic. Sorry about that, it, it froze for a second. But before I start, I want to just take a step back. You know, take a step back and give you guys a, you know, what could be said, a checklist. Because oftentimes, sometimes, you know, not always, sometimes me as an audience member, whenever I listen to a presenter or a professor, not Dr. Bobby, I, I never do that, but, you know, sometimes I zone out um, and, you know, and whenever I zone out, I get lost and I don't know what's being said or trying or talked about. So I think by giving an outline or a brief introduction, you, go, you guys could understand what's going to be talked about in this presentation. You know, if you guys understand what's going to be talked about in presentation and know how this presentation is going to be, you know, presented, I think it's gonna be a good way to, 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 to feed you guys knowledge on this topic. You know, so the first thing that I'm gonna be doing today is I'm gonna be talking about invasive species and what they are. You know, I know you guys may be familiar with them, like I said before, but I think in order to, to dive in into a specific example of invasive species and its effect on the environment, I think I have to give you guys an introduction, a formal introduction on what they are, you know, where invasive species could be found or like originated. Um, and then lastly, the consequences that come from it. The second thing is once I give you guys a brief introduction, I'm going to, you know, dive in deeper and give a more narrow approach of an, a study that was done. Actually, it's, it was a study on invasive birds, 
in Israel. Super, super interesting. Very, very cool. And that's going to give you guys a better understanding of real life consequences of invasive species on actually the habitat and species itself. Then the last thing that, you know, I'll be talking about is a take home message. And these are basically three or four points that I want you as an audience member to, to take take out of this, you know, to, to you know, if, if for some reason you weren't listening at all to me, maybe my voice bored you or something. I don't know. Maybe I wasn't looking good today. I don't know. These take home messages, these points, three or four points um, that you get out of it is what I want you to implement into your brain, you know, and I want you to get out of this presentation. Okay. So let's, let's, let's ask ourselves a question. Let's, let's, let's ask what makes an invasive species quote unquote invasive. And before I try to answer this question, I want to, to take a, take a step back. So you guys may, you know, know or you know have a understanding of invasive species based on its effect on the environment which we'll get into later but you know invasive species sometimes may you know have negative consequences i mean a lot of a lot of times negative consequences is associated with invasive species and that is true that is generally true by science however however Whatever. If I just simply, you know, wrote on my PowerPoint right here, invasive species become invasive because they have negative consequences on the environment. Some scientists may, who are listening, may come up and disagree with me because it's actually debatable on whether or not invasive species are only invasive because they um, create negative consequences. And having said that, that is why I'm basing my you know, my information and my fundamental basis on this thing that's called the novel weapons hypothesis. And it's basically a statement used by scientists, you know, and it's a theory basically where, you know, invasive species, when they enter a new environment, they create negative consequences. And if I base it on that, you know, scientists, other scientists that disagree with me and don't accept this hypothesis, you know, can't, can't be mad at me. Having said that, there's actually two or three other ways that help species that, you know, enter new environment become more prominent or, you know, help them become identified as quote unquote invasive. The first one being is the lack of predators. So when an invasive species enters a new environment, it disrupts something that's called the co-evolutionary arms race. And, you know, if you guys don't know what this is, let's, let's take a step back and look at these two organisms I listed above. You know, this, this antelope right here on the right and above it is a cheetah. I'm sure you guys know that, you know, these two organisms have a predator-prey relationship. So, you know, the antelope is... It's usually eaten by the cheetah, and the cheetah usually eats the antelope. You know, that's how it works. And whenever these two organisms, you know, interact with each other, it basically creates a phenomenon where these two organisms co-evolve together. For example, antelope can evolve to become faster and to be able to escape a cheetah and to not be eaten. And if it doesn't get eaten, it's done its job. A cheetah can do the opposite. It's going to try to evolve itself to have characteristics to, to be able to catch the antelope more effectively. And if it gets its food for the night, if it gets its dinner, it's in its job. And what this occurs, why it's called a co-evolutionary arms race, is basically two organisms trying to race each other to, to, to be evolved to have an advantage over each other. But what this ends up as being as these two organisms just keep evolving, keep evolving, 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 evolving together, together. They just keep evolving until no one gains the advantage. They just keep evolving. But when an invasive species come into a new environment, let's take the cheetah, for example, okay? 
whatever the environment that a cheetah comes from. If an invasive species comes into an environment and interacts with a cheetah, the cheetah is not adapted to, to be able to, to hunt this, this, this new invasive species. So this results in an invasive species disrupting this race. It, it, can't, it can't be exploited by the cheetah. So it results in invasive species not having any predatory control over it. It can literally just chill in the new environment, just you know, spread as much as it wants without worrying about being eaten. And it can create, it become invasive. The second thing is sometimes invasive species can exploit resources. So it, it exploits resources that other native species cannot, and it can create uh, a situation where invasive species just take a hold of the new environment over these native species. Uh, the last thing that, that, that occurs, and sometimes, you know, this is true, sometimes invasive species alter an environment in order to favor them, in order so that environment and those characteristics and conditions favor that invasive species. That's called ecological facilitation. This term right here on the bottom, ecological facilitation. When an invasive species alters the environment in order to favor itself. An example of this is the yellow stars thistle. This this bright, 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 bright plant on the on the far right that I listed right here. This is an invasive species, an invasive plant species. And it was introduced in the West Coast. And what's special about this um, you know, invasive uh, plant species is that it actually secretes a very, very harmful chemical compound. Um, I'm not going to pronounce the name. Uh, you know, I, I hate chemistry, but you know, that's besides the point. But you know, it's this 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 chemical compound that that you know that is secreted by the roots of this plant is very, very harmful to native plants. So what this caused was native plants being killed or you know destroyed by the, the yellow stars thistle chemical compound. And it, it could it basically eliminated any competition for these yellow stars to be able to, 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 to encounter. Okay. And, and th these are just a couple of ways based on the novel's weapons hypothesis on how invasive species can be labeled as invasive. Now that we talked about that, let's talk about, you know, how do invasive species come into a new environment? You know, it's a great question. And I personally would summarize, you know, how invasive species come into a new environment based on two ways. They either come into an environment accidentally or intentionally. The first example is some species just were placed in into an ecosystem intentionally. An example of this is the beach vitex. And this, this is the plant right on, on the far bottom right right here. This is the this is a beach vitex. And it was actually brought in in the 1980s intentionally as a ornamental plant um, on the coast of North Carolina. In the, in the 1980s. But, you know, what's special about you know, native plants, if you guys don't know, in, in the, on the coast of North Carolina is a lot of the native plants there have very, very, very extensive um, roots. It has a very extensive root system because it has to be, you know, sustained in the sand on the coast of North Carolina in order, in order to be stabilized. But what, what, what's special about this beach vitex plant is it has no extensive root system. It's the opposite of how native plant species there are, you know, are. And, you know, this basically results in beach vitex plants creating erosion. And when erosion happens, it can eliminate any plant species that are, you know, 
hastened in the, uh, in, in, the, in the sand and they can kill them. And it also eliminates any competition for the beach vitex to encounter. Um, so it went from being ornamental plant to become an invasive uh, species. But you know, speaking of that, sometimes species were brought in to control other invasive species and it failed. A super famous example of this are rats. So in the 1800, on the Virgin Islands, uh, rats would actually sneak up on ships that would come from the mainland to the Virgin Islands. And when, uh, you know, the, the more they did this, um, the more negative consequences they had on the Virgin Islands. Actually, these rats created massive, massive crop damage. Like it was unbelievable. And farmers noticed this. So they were like, hmm, I know it's rats doing this. So they decided to, to try to get rid of them or try to control the pace of, the, of them being invasive. And they did this by bringing in a very, very famous predator, which is a mongoose. It's super, super, super famous. They love eating rats. Mongoose love eating rats. But it failed. It failed drastically. And it's for two reasons that it failed. The first reason is rats are nocturnal. So they're active during the night and sleep during the day. But also rats also live in trees. So, but mongoose, they're opposite. They, they sleep at night and they're active during the day. Also, they can't climb trees. So even if they were nocturnal, it wouldn't happen. So in result, it resulted in, you know, the Virgin Islands having zero invasive species to two, which was rats and mongoose. The third thing is sometimes species can be brought in accidentally. Sometimes by shipping, shipping is a very famous example of that. I, you know, if you think about it, for a millennia, um, the Great Lakes were a great example of that. And the Great Lakes for a good portion were easily separated for like main parts of, you know, water, um, like, like the Atlantic Ocean. And the United States actually helped create a better way of ships reaching the Great Lakes um, via from, from the from the from major ocean body parts such as the Atlantic Ocean by building this thing called the St. Lawrence Seaway. It's basically a system of canals and dams um, to connect the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean. However, by doing this, it also created a way for invasive plants to be brought in from the Atlantic Ocean to the Great Lakes via ballast water. If you guys don't know what ballast water is, it's basically a thing where ships, especially when they don't have like any like heavy cargo on them, they take in huge amounts of water to weigh the ships down so that it can become stable and have very, very good maneuverability. And whenever, well, let's say a ship would take in a lot of water, ballast water from the Atlantic Ocean and it would come into the port of the Great Lakes, it would release tons of tons of, I don't know, ballast water in order to, to, to have cargo loaded on it. And whenever it would release this ballast water, you know, there were actually invasive species that were that would come about from um, the Atlantic Ocean that would come into Great Lakes. And it soon just became a situation where the Great Lakes had a lot, a lot of invasive plant uh, species. The last thing that I wanna talk about was sometimes, you know, whether it's brought in accidentally or intentionally, invasive species could just be simply, they could just simply spread easily by some component of the habitat. I like to think of like this example of roads. Roads are a great, great example. Of this. You know, if you think about it, guys, if especially if you're in Georgia, um, you know, apart from 
maybe a couple of deer crossing over the road sometimes here now and then. You don't see a lot of biodiversity. You don't see a lot of animals around roads, mostly because, you know, humans and human activity. But this, this, this concept of no biodiversity or no species being there around roads can help invasive species. It can help them spread because let's say species can just travel across, you know, it can travel across the habitat and not worry about interacting with any other species that could potentially be a predator and just and just spread along with no care and yeah so brief understanding on how invasive species come into the environment now let's get into the the interesting part and what holds dear to my heart okay let's talk about the consequences of invasive species and you know I just want to clarify again, I'm basing this, this, this slide and this information on the novel's weapons hypothesis. Okay, so I just want to make it clear. And because of that, you know, I'm going to say that invasive species have negative consequences on the environment. I've said this before, and it can have negative consequences on the environment for a couple of reasons. The first one being, it can create widespread loss of habitat. A super, super, super famous example of this are kudzu vines. And these vines are very, very famous in the south. And they actually spread across force and actually a big amounts of force. And how they affect these force is once they spread, once they spread more and more and more, they actually prevent any sunlight from hitting forest and then results in forest having no availability towards any sunlight and it kills these forests eventually. Another thing is that these vines have very, very thick, like very thick mats and it can weigh trees down and it results in you know, huge, 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 huge lots of forests and it just literally just kills a bunch of forests. Not only do, you know, invasive species can create widespread loss of habitat, it can actually alter habitat. A famous, famous, famous example of this is beavers. And it's funny because, you know, you wouldn't think beavers of being invasive species. Usually, especially in North America, beavers are treated as you know, species that are endangered and they are try to, you know, prevent them from being extinct. You know, they don't usually try to try to keep them from becoming invasive. That's that's the opposite. However, in the 1940s, about 50 beavers were taken from Canada and brought to South America to be hunted for their pelts. And these beavers actually, you know, when they were brought in, these 50, 50 or so beavers, they began to multiply and it turned from 50 beavers all the way to hundreds of thousands of beavers and they become very very invasive and they became invasive because of beaver activity and you know in, in North America you guys are familiar you know with beaver dams you guys know what they are beavers use forests and trees and they gnaw on them they break them down in order to, to, to create these dams for, so they, they can they can live inside them you know it's, it's their habitat the thing about you know what's special about characteristics of forests in north america is that they're very very adapted to beaver activity so when a beaver starts gnawing on a tree or tries to break it down it it adapted to it by growing back. It grows back whenever, you know, you know, a, a beaver would affect it. And it's not as easily affected by negative consequences of beaver activity. The same cannot be true for forests in South America. Forests in South America aren't, they're not used to beavers being there. They're not used to beaver activity because beaver don't, don't originate from there. So when beavers were causing, you know, trying to build dams in South America, it would cause huge, huge, huge amounts of forest loss because these forests aren't adapted to beaver activity and they would not grow back. And actually the article that I was reading this about, 
said that forests in South America, after you know beaver activity was was done, it looked like a bulldozer ran straight through forests. It was pretty, pretty, pretty crazy. And it's crazy how beavers create such huge loss. And then, but the thing is about invasive species is that not only it can create an effect loss and affect the environment negatively, it can affect species, especially endemic species. A huge famous example that I'm actually very, very knowledgeable about is Burmese pythons. And these pythons are um, invasive in the Everglades in, in South Florida. And they're super, super you know, invasive and they're actually cryptic species. So um, if you guys don't know, that's basically where Burmese pythons are very, very hard to be tracked by the human eye. And they look like other native snakes there. So scientists can't, you know, differentiate between a Burmese python and a, um, like a native bird, bird species. But besides the point, these Burmese pythons hunt massive amounts of native uh, prey there, massive. Because for two, first one being, these pythons right here, they they actually live a portion of their life in water. So they can actually reside in water once they grow up. Also, they can reside in land. So any any native organism, whether it's on in water or on land, it's free game for these pythons. So this resulted in widespread loss of, you know, and death of endemic species. Actually, about 30 or so native bird species were found in guts of um, Burmese pythons. When, when, when studied um, the consequences of, 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 of these species on the Everglades. But you know, now that we talked about how they affect species, it can actually affect you and I. Invasive species can actually affect you and I. An example of this are zebra mussels. So zebra mussels are unique because they actually accumulate like toxins in their tissues. So when an uh, organism that usually is a predator of zebra mussels eats it, it could travel all the way up the food chain, all the way to us humans. And these toxins can also be passed, passed down and it can reach us and it can affect us in a harmful way. The last thing that is actually super important is, you know, invasive species create huge economic costs. You know, it takes a lot, a lot of money to try to prevent any loss or any consequences of invasive species. Actually, it takes about $150 million to, to try to prevent any damage of these kudzu vines that I previously mentioned because these vines grow on power lines. So it's, it's, that could be, you, you understand how that could be harmful to, to, to the environment. But you know, now that I've given you guys an introduction on, uh, you know, on, on what birds, uh, you know, invasive species are, where they come from, what consequences arise from them, let's dive into a specific example. Let's dive into a study. An example that can give you a better, you know, understanding is let's look at invasive birds versus native birds in Israel. So this was a study done a couple of years back. Um, and in 2017, 2017, I believe. And that these group of scientists, they, they noticed one thing. They noticed that a lot of times uh, biotic homogenization was occurring in Israel. And if you don't know what this is, it's basically a process where, how I like to think about it is when two, you have two habitats, one unique habitat and the other, and you know, whether that's because of invasive species or some sort of, you know, exchange between species, they become way more similar. So whenever these two uh, habitats become more similar, this can affect uh, like endemic species that are only used to certain environments in um, 
their specific habitat. So endemic species, they can't be used, they're not used to change of the environment, but you know, biotic homogenization or BH, because I also call that because I had a hard time pronouncing it whenever I practice saying it. it, it can create change, which is very, 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 it could be harmful to, to, to native birds, specifically native organisms actually. And whenever BH occurred, the thing that was special about native birds in Israel was that a lot of these birds were generalist bird species. And what that was saying, what that meant was whenever change or BH occurred, these birds were adapted to um, any change of the environment because they, you know, they're, they're generalists. So they, they, they have general, you know, um, habitat requirements. They don't need specific ones like some like endemic species need. Um, and that's why they were considered quote unquote winners you know, they, nothing, no negative consequences were acquired to them whenever BH occurred. But, you know, the, 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 you know, whenever non-native birds entered into the picture, this changed the picture quite drastically. And scientists noticed this. So they basically hypothesized, you know, I, I listed here was when BH occurs, non-native birds are quote unquote winners while native birds become losers. What that means is whenever, you know, change happens in a habitat or a habitat becomes way more similar to, to another habitat, non-native birds are more easily adapted to that change and, and they affect these native birds somehow, some way that create them that, that help them become losers. So they become less, they have they have less, um, they have less ability to be able to, to, to adapt to change to, to, to whenever BH occurs. And they tried to, to see if their hypothesis was correct by looking at three data sets that they included in their study. And these data sets basically, it compromised different amounts of abundance of native birds and common birds that were found in um, Israel. And they just looked at how the abundance of birds changed over the years. And with that being said, whenever they analyzed these three data sets and they did very, very complicated like analyzation of data sets. I, I wasn't gonna include that because it would bore you guys and it's complicated and not, this isn't like a statistic class, but you know, they found two things. And these two things are basically the summarization of the whole article is, you know, the first thing is they found that non-native birds so an example of this is a, a house sparrow. This is this is a um, um, a excuse me. This is a common bird. So a native bird would be right here. This is a parakeet. A non-native bird thrived in the BH process. So this is a parakeet that's not native to Israel. It's invasive. Thrived when BH, aka change, occurred while you know, native birds such as this house sparrow right here did not, it became a loser. You know, a second thing they found was that populations of native birds significantly changed over the years, meaning, you know, abundance of, you know, house sparrows drastically changed in a negative way, while the opposite was true for invasive birds such as, you know, the parakeet, it became drastically, it increased drastically. And these two actually, these two foundings and results can be summarized in the next two figures that I will be showing you guys. So right here, this, this figure that I have you, I have pulled up, it's one of the many, many figures that uh, was shown in this study. And let's, if you, if you take a look on the top, the top right, the top, the top right here. This is a house pair. So this is, this is um, a 
a figure that they created based on their analyzation of a particular data set. This, this data set was named Israel. Don't worry about the name, it's not important, but um, you know they have different names for different data sets. And Israel was the first data set that they looked at. And they looked at the abundance of house sparrows and how they change over you. So if you look to the bottom, look at the X axis, okay? So you have the number of years. So you have 2010 to 2015. You know, this is the number, this is the years that were included in all the data sets throughout the years and how birds changed. And if you look on the Y axis right here, it says abundance of house sparrows. So they basically wanted to summarize how birds, how this bird changed over the years and how the abundance of, 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 the, of the house sparrows change over the course of what, 10, 10 or so years. And as you can see, as the years go by, you know, what happens to bird species? The abundance of this house sparrow, it goes down. The abundance lowers, it becomes, it went from, you know, middle of seven all the way to six. So it, it actually decreased. So, and they found this, similar to other um, common birds that were found in Israel, the abundance of birds decreased as, as change occurred and as the years had gone by. The second thing is, you know, sometimes, um, you know, th this, is, this is a graph right here. This is very, very, very um, general. Um, and this is, uh, a bigger picture of all the figures that they made. So if you guys can look, um, you can see three, like three sections, you know, each section represents um, figures that they did for each data set. So for example, for Israel, they have, you know, one lines for Israel, which is one, the first data set. The second data set was this, this name, Yarkon Park. And the third one was called the reserve, which is the third data set. And um, you know, um, if you let's 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 take a look at this house bro. Let's look at it compared to the other data sets. So as I said before, you know, the, as the years gone by, the abundance of house sparrows has decreased. The same correlation can be found in the other data set that they found. As the years have gone by, the abundance of house sparrows changed. And if you are wondering why the second data set has no like linear slope, it's because they they found that the the abundance of both invasive birds and common birds in the second data set there were significant enough to be included. There was no significant enough change, so that's why there was no linear uh, slope. But let's look at um, let's look at the opposite. Let's look at these invasive plants. So this is the parakeet right here, which is also like I said before previously. Um, Sorry, that's thunder. Hope, we, hope that wasn't too loud. But um, anyways, this is a, a parakeet that they also looked at for the first data set. So if you look at this one, you know, as the years have gone by, the years have, 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 have gone by, you know, the x-axis years, remember, y-axis, abundance of birds, as the years have gone by, it's increased. You know, it's, it has the opposite correlation to, to, to what these house sparrows are experiencing. These are declining while invasive birds are inclining. These are thriving while this is not thriving. Same can be true for the third data set, same correlation. As the years go by, the abundance of birds increases. So this is just a super, super, super good example of, you know, of, of a summary of their analyzation of all these data sets of birds in Israel. So now that I've given you guys you know, a, a summary of results and how this study can be taken into consideration of how invasive birds affect native birds and in the environment, let's 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 talk about let's have a little discussion, you know, because I know this is more text than I usually have, but, you know, I, th I think it's important to, to include this is, you know, invasive birds, 
you know, I'll compete in AdWords in the BH process. This was found true in the two figures that I found. You guys remember, you know, at the abundance of common birds were found to be declining over the years, while the opposite was true was invasive birds were found to be increasing as the years gone by. And keep in mind, or was that these, these scientists that were doing the study, they were not trying to find out why or how these invasive birds outcompeted native birds. Like they didn't say, oh, it was because of competition. They just simply said, okay, we're going to analyze some data sets. We're gonna look at the trends that are evident in there and give you guys a summarization in, in based on figures, okay? The second thing was obviously population of native birds have been declining slowly as seen as I seen in the graphs as well. In contrast, non-native birds have increased by 250% to 850%. So same thing could be said in, in the figures, same correlation, just in figure form. And the last thing that I think is important to include in the study was at the end, these scientists would uh, basically talk about how they predicted that if this trend were to go on you know, year by year, Israel would basically have a situation where they would only have invasive birds. There would be no more native birds in Israel because of how drastically these non-native birds are thriving in the BH process in, in contrast to native birds. And they said that there needed to be strategies implemented in order to prevent this because if this went on, it, it would be a serious problem towards native birds. These native birds would basically become extinct in Israel. And you know, this, this, this is basically a very, very, very great example of how birds and honestly how the environment is affected by invasive species. Now, now that we're finally back to the take home message, you know, uh, I want to give you guys a couple points on, on what I feel like are the most important key points in my presentation. So if you weren't listening, you know, hopefully you were, hopefully my voice didn't bore you. <laughs> but, you know, the first thing that I want you guys to remember once, once you leave this presentation is that invasive species originate accidentally or intentionally. Remember, it can be brought in you know, as an ornamental plant and then it becomes invasive. It can be brought in to control other plant species like or other uh, native species. And it could be, excuse me, invasive species. Um, so, you know, remember intentionally or accidentally, two basically two ways that invasive species come about and they become invasive. Another thing that it's important, you know, and I think it's important to remember is that invasive species have negative consequences. I have in parentheses generally believed because you know obviously some people may disagree with me, but based on the novel weapons hypothesis, invasive species have an invasive uh, have a negative consequence on the environment if they're invasive. The last thing is that you know especially you know with the study that I talked about. Invasive species have a huge, huge impact on native species. I think that's one of the biggest consequences that I believe is prominent and, and negative consequences in the environment because they have a huge effect. You know, example, those those invasive birds, you know, we don't know, you know, we don't know the reason like why, you know, maybe it's competition. Um, why these invasive birds are dominating native species uh, birds but they are. And I think it's very, very important to understand, you know, that invasive species have huge, huge effects on the environment. Here's my references. You guys don't need to, this is for Dr. Bobby, but you know, um, now that I've finished my presentation. Uh, thank you guys for watching. I very much appreciate you guys, you know, staying tuned. Hopefully my voice didn't bore you the whole time. Hopefully you actually got something out of this. Um, 
and I taught you something about this topic that actually is very, very dear and near to my heart. So with that being said, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day and so yeah.